Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, I have the pleasure of being joined by the amazing Darkness Tales, with stories that are sure to chill you to your core. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. Up until January 12th of 2047, it was widely accepted that the ex-planet Pluto was accompanied by five natural satellites. Charon, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. The crew of the deep space exploration vessel Hermes discovered a sixth moon while photographing the distant planet as they orbited Neptune before their final journey home. When Houston was informed of the development, they were underwhelmed to say the least, as any mass as small as Hermes was described was far too small to be interesting in any way. It wasn't until the second report came in that Control showed any interest in exploring the new body. I was in charge of navigation and system maintenance on the Hermes, which is why I was the first one to notice something strange with the moon. At first, I assumed it was a technical issue with the instruments, but not one wire or fuse was out of place, and after several diagnostic checks and two system reboots, nothing had changed. Had the pilot known what the instruments were reading, he would have been just as perplexed as I. Every number in calculation pointed to one observation. The small moon had stopped its own orbit. It hadn't even slowed down before halting. It went from 4,474 miles per hour to zero in an instant in time, as if our attention had alerted it to our presence. Needless to say, Houston extended our deep space stay and ordered an immediate expedition to the unknown satellite of Pluto. After one month of travel through the outer edge of the solar system, we could finally view the object with our own eyes, which was a disturbing notion considering the appearance of the thing. We didn't have a visual at first, since we had to enter Pluto's orbit from the opposite side of the planet. But once it rose over the horizon, we could view it directly out of the cockpit window and record it using our forward cameras. From a greater distance, it seemed to be a natural body, but as the distance decreased, the true nature of the object's surface was revealed. The entire landmass consisted of triangles interlocked in a pattern to create a sphere almost like the latticework on a dome structure. Any ideas about natural formation were dispelled, and new thoughts entered our minds in the minds of those in the control room on Earth. Thoughts of our place in the universe. We were not alone. We were never alone. Our analysts came up with a rough estimation that any beings technologically advanced enough to create such a structure capable of instantaneously and absolutely changing its speed despite its own momentum would have to have been around for millions of years before the first human was banging rocks together. In quite an unprofessional tone of skepticism, he also told us that the physics of the situation were quite impossible, and that such beings might also have to be fourth dimensional. These words were colder and more frightening than the empty space outside our cabin. I didn't speak for a while. Less interesting, but still extremely significant, was the light being emitted from the surface. It wasn't reflection from the sun, nor was it because of any natural phenomenon, being as sensors indicated that the structure was completely hollow. It was a bright white neon glow coming from outlines of each triangle. And seeing as measurement and calculations concluded that there were more than 100 billion panels making up the surface, the light was verging on blinding. We wondered why we hadn't seen the light emitting from the object earlier. We could only assume it was getting brighter as we got closer. Because the satellite was stationary, 
and we had to remain in orbit to keep from crashing to Pluto's surface. We only had a limited amount of time to observe. The entire crew watched through the rear deck as the object set over the horizon of our ex-planet. We would have to wait until we came back around before we could take any more readings. We tried to sleep, but the tension, fear, and excitement of our new discovery forbid it. So we spent the night reviewing data and video footage. Because we were orbiting in geosynchronous orbit, and because one day on Pluto lasts more than six times as long on Earth, it was approximately 72 hours before we could see the mystery object again. Our eyes widened as it peeked over the horizon. A lot had changed. It was now roughly twice its original size, and the white neon light had changed to a vibrant orange color. This would have been startling in itself, but considering that our telescope hadn't picked up any change in the object since we had left Neptune more than a month ago, we couldn't help but feel that it knew we were there, and that its new appearance definitely suggested that we weren't safe. Our initial fears were instantly confirmed when the Hermes suddenly began to creak and moan and a low humming noise could be heard outside the ship. Because there is no air in space, there is nothing to carry sound waves, which is why the entire crew immediately began to search every instrument and dashboard in the ship for answers. We soon found that the source of the noise was in fact coming from the object when the entire ship went dark. Engines, electronic systems, boosters, escape pods, emergency systems, life support, everything was down. The only source of light was the moon itself, which bathed every inch of the ship in that sinister glow, which had now turned bright red. The humming intensified as our communications officer tried frantically to reach Houston. None of us tried to comfort or help him as we were in awe of the growing alien structure. He started to tear up as his breaths got shorter and quicker. He eventually passed out after trying in vain to get a signal out for at least three minutes. As I and the remaining crew found out later, unconsciousness would have been preferable considering the events that were about to transpire. All noise stopped abruptly as our systems came back online, as if nothing had ever happened. I immediately hit record on the forward and aft cameras in case anything else were to happen. The structure began to flip and spin in ways that didn't seem possible. The massive sphere seemed to be turning inside out and yet not moving at all. It spun faster than the eye could conceive and yet stayed perfectly still all at the same time. Simply viewing the event made me and the other crew members nauseous and dizzy. The captain threw up on the floor and passed out. The rest of us simply tried to look away, but the feeling kept intensifying. Each of us dropped to the floor covered in our own vomit, one after the other. I fell to my knees. Blood was pouring from my nose and mixing with the previous contents of my stomach on the floor. The last thing I saw before my vision went dark was my own reflection in the glass of the forward observation deck. My comrades were piled around me on the floor, bloody-nosed and covered in bile. There was a figure behind me. It was standing. It clearly wasn't a crew member. I went unconscious before I could turn around to face it. I saw the fear in my own eyes as my head dropped to the floor. I had the strangest dream during my unconsciousness. I was back home in New Orleans, walking down my street. Every light in the city was off, but I could still see by the light of the burning buildings and cars on the street. Bodies were piled up in the alleyways, some charred and burned, some still ablaze. I got to the end of the street and looked out into the bay. There was no water, only the deep mud of the riverbed. 
rotting fish filled the air. I turned around to see the bodies of my wife and son laying in the road. That pulled me out of it. My eyes opened slowly. My head was killing me. My vision was blurry and I could barely move. I had been placed up against the wall of the room. Had a crew member moved me? I didn't care. I had more important questions. Our communications officer was seated on my left near the corner, also leaning up against the wall and still unconscious. My vision was clearing up. I wish it hadn't. I wish I could have stayed there, unaware of what was going on. I would have rather died. I looked to my right. There were the bodies of my shipmates piled on the floor. All of them had their eyes wide open. Their pupils completely blacked out except, of course, for the blood that was dripping out of their tear ducts. Standing at least eight feet over the corpses of my friends was the figure I had seen earlier. My heart started pounding the moment I looked up. It had inky black skin which shimmered in the light of the moon. Its body was completely featureless except for three vertical lines across its face that were glowing with the same intensity and color as the panels on the structure. Its arm was outstretched. Its fingers were wrapped around the head of our captain in such a fashion that his face was completely covered. The captain's arms were stretched out behind his body. His knees were still on the floor but his back was arched as if every muscle in his body was tensed. He shook with the strain of his own muscles flexing and I could hear him moaning in a painful manner. Kill it. I had to. I had to do something. I couldn't just let this happen. I was clearly next in line for whatever that thing was doing to my comrades. Kill it now. What was I supposed to do? This was an exploratory mission. We didn't have any weapons. Nothing. You have to find something. I searched around the room trying not to be noticed by it. There. A pair of scissors laying on the floor between me and the communications officer. I reached for them as slowly as I could, keeping my eyes on the creature. It was peering down at my captain, who was still convulsing. I had them in my hand, but I needed a plan. The thing looked like flesh and blood. Go for the neck. I grasped the scissors firmly in my blood-covered hand. It was now or never. I leaned forwards, constantly watching the creature suck the life out of the captain. Slowly now, don't let it see you. The communications officer coughed and moaned loudly behind me. Damn. The creature's head snapped around and peered directly at me. Do it now. I jumped to my feet and ran across the room toward my target. The captain's body fell limp to the ground as the alien turned to face me. But it was already too late for it. I plunged my makeshift weapon as deep as I could into its throat, twisting the scissors to inflict as much damage as possible. It stumbled backwards, hitting the other wall, clutching at the wound to its neck. It was oozing liquid onto the floor and onto itself. The blood glowed a bright neon red just like the moon. The creature slid down the wall onto the floor, still staring into my eyes. Its body began to fade away like the signal on a television turning into static. I felt the same sickness and pain as before and stumbled back, looking away to avoid the headache. I looked up, and the creature was gone. A bloody pair of scissors in its place. I made the assumption that it had gone back to its ship, and that more were coming in its place. Most likely, I would end up like the rest of my crew if any more of those things got on board. Get the hell out of here now. 
I picked up the communications officer as well as the scissors and started towards the ladder to the cockpit. The officer wasn't conscious enough yet to even walk, much less climb a ladder. I left him at the bottom and scrambled up to the next floor, immediately passing through the airlock and into the control room. I ran to the generator panel and turned off the gravity systems. I went head first into the ladder corridor, reaching for the officer's jacket to haul him up with me. I looked upside down, through the rungs of the ladder, down to the ship's main hallway and immediately saw two more creatures materialize out of thin air. My demeanor shifted from calm determination to frantic anxiety. I threw the communications officer into the cockpit and slammed the airtight hatch. I rushed to the flight controls, still not sure how to get rid of the aggressors. The hatch behind me started to hum and vibrate. It wouldn't be long before they got through. I searched the switchboard for something I could use against them. Something that would turn the tides. There, a red button labeled Atmosphere Flush. I entered my passcode and pressed it without hesitation, not even sure if the vacuum of space would affect the creatures. I heard the air in the rest of the ship get sucked into the void followed by a cold silence. I didn't know if the creatures were gone or not, but I wasn't going to wait around to find out. I set the ship at a full speed collision course with the moon, making sure to shut down the cooling systems for the fusion reactor. The Hermes was going to make an excellent torpedo. The last thing I was going to do was let those bastards get to Earth. I could only assume that they attacked our ship to glean information on our home planet, and my assumption continued to conclude that they weren't friendly, especially based on the events of the past few hours, which gave me comfort considering that they were about to suffer the heat of a 40 megaton blast. I began to ready an escape vessel. The Hermes was equipped with three pods in total, but me and the officer would only need one, seeing as the rest of the crew were dead. I said a prayer for my fallen friends as I loaded the food and supplies of the other pods into the one that we would be using. The hatch door sealing us off from the rest of the ship began to vibrate again. I hadn't killed them, but I had slowed them down enough to leave. I closed the pod door just as the floor hatch burst open and the two creatures floated into the room, again staring directly through the window at me. The pod burst from its docking bay, away from the Hermes. I watched it accelerate away toward the alien moon, fading away into the complexity of the alien latticework until I lost sight of it completely. There was a blinding flash of light silent in the vastness of deep space. The neon glow of the unknown satellite of Pluto flickered and faded from red to orange, then finally back to white, before going out completely. Debris scattered into space, in all directions, twinkling as they reflected the light of our sun, which was now rising from behind Pluto. I stared in awe at our home star so far away, yet still so bright. The natural light was comforting. I floated there for a while, my face against the edge of the porthole, not thinking about anything at all except the cold glass against my cheek and the sweat floating weightless on my nose. The officer and I had a long journey home. I could only pray that I had seen the last of those things. I set a course for Earth. A single engine private plane, skimming low over the Alaskan wilderness. Glacial waters as clear as a polished mirror, reflecting the vast primordial forest and savage peaks which loom above us, a testament to the stoic grandeur of an earth 
which existed long before humanity and will continue to endure long after the footnote of our existence has been forgotten. For one glorious moment, it feels as though the world was created just for us. But that was before the engine stalled mid-flight, before the violent plummet and the mercy of a deaf god, before the ground accelerated towards us, all happening much too fast to regain altitude before the crash. An explosion so loud, it was silent. Light, so bright, I saw nothing. Bone jarring impact. Everything lurched so bad, it felt like my soul must have been ripped clean from my body. I wish I'd died the second we hit the ground. I wish my husband had too, but he lingered in that broken body until nightfall. Our hands had never clasped so tightly, as when sealed together with his blood, and no words were as precious as those escaping between his shallow breaths. Promise me that you'll survive, he said, whatever it takes. I wasn't in a much better condition than him. One of my legs was broken, several ribs had snapped, and three of my fingers were still clinging to the bottom of my seat where I'd braced for the crash. Now, a dozen feet away, I didn't expect to last the night, but I still made that promise. I'd like to think that Hope gave some small comfort before his eyes closed for the last time. After that came the war between slow starvation and my desperate hope of being saved. A hungry animal could easily find me first though, lured by the scent of charred flesh and fresh blood, which teased my nostrils. But there was another war going on on the surface. My human dignity against my will to survive. I lasted almost four days before I took the first bite. Just a mouthful, holding the strip of his skin to my mouth and wetting my parched throat with his blood. By the end of the week, I'd become more methodical stripping the flesh clean to roast, cracking the bones for their marrow, wasting nothing. By the end of two weeks, there was nothing left of my husband. I'd given up on ever being rescued. Instead, starting the long walk back towards civilization, I was amazed at how quickly my legs had healed, and as I tracked, I felt myself filled with a restless vitality that I could only attribute to my will to live. I barely slept at night, and barely rested during the day. It's almost as if I'd spent my entire life being sick, but I'd gotten so used to the feeling that I thought that's how everyone is supposed to feel. I can tell you right now that life is a lie. Your blood is not supposed to be passed sluggishly and unnoticed through your veins. It's power, dormant. You should feel the electricity of your flexing muscles. Each explosive fibre primed to your will. Those pristine wildernesses were not where I had been banished to die. It's where I came alive. I don't know how long I travelled in such a state, falling into a trance from my single-minded determination. I think my husband's spirit must have been guiding me through though. 
because I found a sudden understanding in navigating from the stars, just like he learnt from the navy. Eventually, I found what I was looking for, a couple of campers, fresh from the big city. I was so relieved at hearing another human voice through the trees, that I surged forward like a wild thing. All my pain and sacrifice had been building to this moment. Elegant French words, a woman's laughter, a way home. That is what I'd kept myself alive for. But that's when I saw them. Him panting and sweating to move his grotesque belly. Her screaming and carrying on as though I were less than human. Well, it goes to show that you sometimes need to take a step back in order to see things clearly. After everything I'd been through, I couldn't feel anything but pity and disgust for these torpid creatures, willing victims of what their artificial life had deformed them into. The husband was bigger, but the wife tasted better, cleaner. I lived more vibrantly in those next few nights, feasting and regaining my strength from their unused bodies. Then all the years they'd wasted on being half alive. I wasn't only getting stronger either. I started catching my thoughts, slipping in and out of French. I thought my husband had been guiding me through the woods. But now, it seemed more appropriate to say that I had consumed some aspect of him, just as I had done with the French couple. I was hungrier than ever, gnawing, incessant hunger, almost as soon as I'd finished. Like my stomach, threatened to digest itself if I didn't get more. I tried eating some of the trail mix and granola bars in their packs, but it tasted like so much sawdust and dirt. Even the beef jerky tasted like cardboard, although that's not unusual by itself. And it was obvious that the more I ate, the more I needed it. The prospect of returning to my frail old self, unbearable. But the idea of living in the woods, biding my time in agonizing solitude, whilst waiting for my next chance for a meal, I don't think that's any better. Unless, of course, I go back to my old life without giving up what I need to survive and such easy targets. There are the kindergarten where I used to teach. I didn't even waste time stopping at a hospital. My wounds had mended on their own, all but the missing fingers. I only stopped off at home long enough for a shower and some new clothes before heading back to the school. Surrounded by a sea of little shaggy heads, not even reaching my waist. I could almost taste them. The other teachers were shocked to hear of what happened, of course. Their version was lighter on the details. But despite their generous offers to help, I insisted that I wanted to be back in the classroom as soon as possible. See guys, I told you she wasn't dead. That was Roddick. He likes to finger paint. I hope it doesn't have a bad flavour. What happened to your hand? Ew, gross, you're gross. I'd be lying if I said this was my first time I'd contemplated Tiffany's horrible demise. You don't have to come back. We're having fun without you. Oh, don't you worry. I squatted down to Sandy's level. Having me around will be more exciting. Now take one of these and hand one out to everyone in class. 
I may be hungry, but I'm not an idiot. I'd never be able to take more than one or two children before causing such a scene that it became impossible to continue. What's she handing out? What is it? Let me see, Tiffany shouted. It's a permission slip, I told her. We're going on a field trip. You, me, the whole class. We're going camping. It's not just the taste that makes children special. It's their innocence. And if I ever want to start over and live a normal life again, I'm going to need to eat until I'm innocent again, too. Hi, it's me. I know that it must be a surprise to hear from me after so long, but I never have been good at goodbyes. I'm in the complex right now at the time of this recording, waiting for you to come back with more supplies. And I thought I'd finally explain just what happened. How you and I got here, and why I left. I owe you that much. Well, I suppose I'll start at the beginning. When I was a girl, I remember looking at the stars every night through my telescope at my parents' summer home. So many little lights. Too many to count. I wanted to go up there so bad. You see, they represented the future to me. I was always taught that the day we reached the stars was the day the future would arrive. It was all I could think about. It became my obsession, my passion. Every day I would go to the library and just learn. Learn about space shuttle, learn about the dangers of space, learn about theories from the Big Bang to the three laws of robotics and everything in between. When at home, I would watch every single sci-fi movie and TV show I could get my hands on. There was never enough time in the day to learn it all. Eventually, I graduated from high school as valedictorian. A prodigy, they called me. Genius, savant. But none of that held any meaning to me. All I cared about was getting to the stars. I entered a university and was, as usual, the top of my class. I got my doctorates in engineering. I was a woman now, but nothing had changed. I still researched and conducted experiments every day as I always had, only now I needed to provide for myself. And I couldn't do that without a job. Luckily, there was no shortage of opportunities for employment and I found myself employed at my university. In a way, I had now found a new home amongst the many students and fellow researchers, each one with their own passions and dreams for the future. Together, we worked tirelessly, day and night. However, everything changed when we went to war. I'm afraid I can't give you as much information as I'd like to in regards of what ignited the conflict. I was never in touch with the current events that surrounded me. All I could think of was the future. So when the government sent a representative to me and my colleagues and demanded that we focus our attention on weapons development and surveillance, I naturally declined. At this, he exploded. He said that I would comply, or I, and more importantly, my friends, would be charged with treason and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do that to them, and, and yet, to yield meant giving up on everything I had ever worked for. It meant that I no longer would be able to reach for the stars, but to be confined to the dirt. In the end, I bent to them, as they knew I would. All of my skills and talents were now being used to destroy my fellow man, instead of raising them to new heights. I fell into depression. What was the point of it all? All of those countless hours of researching and experimenting, all of that work wiped away in a day. I began to hate myself, so much so that I actually considered doing the world a favor and ending it all. At least then my work would no longer be used to hurt people, and I would have done it. 
had I not been saved. In my depression, I had decided to down an entire bottle of aspirin. But, as luck would have it, a colleague of mine by the name of Robert, my future husband, had come upon me while I was passed out on the floor of the main lab. He rushed me to the paramedics and because of him, I had lived. It may sound strange, but I hated him for doing that. What right did he have to stop me? It was a decision that I had made of my own free will. When he heard this, he said something that I did not expect. For someone so smart, you really are stupid, aren't you? I was taken aback by that. I expected anger, yes, but not out of genuine concern. He told me that I had a gift, and it was due to that I had a duty to fulfill. Not to my country, but to the people. And so he helped me in my recovery, and eventually he forgave me. Later, he loved me. It was during the time of my rehabilitation that Robert and I came up with a plan to deceive our government. The war was escalating, and a final confrontation was imminent. There was no time to try and save everybody, but we could save our friends and their families. It wasn't easy. It took every favor I had amassed over the course of my career, but it worked. I sent messages to every member of my team's family that I could reach. While we were able to reach most of them, some were completely lost to us. The country was, by that point, a war zone. Several cities were under siege, and since it was much too much of a risk to send digital messages, we were forced to send couriers. Most came back with their cargo and smuggled them inside the facility via transport trucks. The rest didn't come back at all. While this was happening, Robert was preparing our escape while making sure the top brass was none the wiser. The plan was to turn what was originally a prototype shuttle that we were working on prior to the war and disguising it as a missile. During the demonstration, the missile would transport us towards a shelter that we'd been developing in secret. In truth, that's where their money was really being spent at. It was brilliant. Everything was in place. We managed to smuggle all of our staff and myself on board, but Robert had to stay behind. Someone had to present our demonstration. I was so afraid. What if we got caught? What if Robert got hurt, or worse, killed? What if the rocket simply exploded on the launch pad? So many variables. Too many variables. I watched from a window as Robert set up the diversion. I never realized how good of an actor he really was. Maybe instead of working on algorithms, he should have been a movie star. But I'm getting off topic. Robert managed to fire up the engines. With a 30 second delay before the launch, I saw him arguing with who I assume was a general. I saw Robert elbow him in the gut and run for the shuttle. Men with rifles started firing at him. I ran toward the entrance and let him in. I could hear the bullets flying by my ears and hitting the wall behind us. Somehow, I managed to get Robert inside and seal the door. We were safe. At least, that's what I thought. Robert had been shot. There was so much blood. I tried to help him, but he pushed me away and told me to help strap him in. The shuttle was about to launch, and the men outside were trying to force their way in. I did as he asked. Just as soon as he and I were strapped in, I felt myself being forced back into my seat. We were launching. I looked at the rearview cameras and saw the men outside instantly burn to ash. Then I looked out the window and saw the night sky, full of stars, just like I remembered. I watched as we rose higher and higher. We just kept going until we reached the lower stratosphere. From there, I could see the stars. So close. So bright. So beautiful. But then, from the corner of my eye, I saw a flash of light. 
At first, I assumed that it was the rising of the sun over the horizon, but then there was another flash. Then another. Several blinding lights ignited all across the horizon. It was as if the world was suddenly set ablaze. I'm sure you can figure out what happened. I don't know who launched their missiles first. But sometimes I wonder, did the enemy launch because they thought our shuttle was an ICBM? I don't know. And I probably never will. We started to descend and I watched as the stars disappeared behind the clouds. What I saw after was horrible. I saw cities broken and burned. I saw the gray ash falling over the shattered landscape that was once my world. As we began to descend, I felt our shuttle shake violently from the turbulence. The shockwaves from one of the blasts knocked us off course. We crashed just a few miles off of our intended location. We were too far from the blast itself for it to do any significant damage to the shuttle and the shielding protected us from harmful radiation outside. I unhooked myself and went to check on Robert. The bleeding had stopped, and he said that he was okay. He tried to make it seem that he had no pain, but I could tell he did. We geared up for the walk. We had experimental suits designed for our astronauts. They were still in the prototype stage, but we were more than confident that they'd hold up to the environment outside. It's funny, really. Suits that I had helped develop for space travel were instead being used on Earth. After helping Robert into his suit, I opened the hatch and climbed out with the others. It was like being on another world. Blackened skies, falling ash, scorched earth, and broken, skeletal remains of a city in the distance. I looked back at the shuttle. On all of my work, my passion, my dreams. Then turned away. We walked. For hours we walked. Until the sky began to finally become a bit less dark. We couldn't see it because of the clouds, you see. But the sun must have been rising. We had finally made it into the city. What was left of it, anyways. We passed the charred remains of what was once our proud civilization. I saw a whole skyscraper impaled on another as if it was simply ripped from its very foundation and thrown like a spear. But what got me the most was when we passed these shadows burned into the wall of a building. They were of a man and a little girl holding hands trying to escape the blast. I looked away and forced the thought from my mind. I still think about them sometimes. Eventually we made it. The building where the shelter was was gone. Not a single brick was left. Luckily, we were prepared for this. You see, the building wasn't the shelter. The shelter was built underneath it. Below were miles upon miles of abandoned subway tunnels, perfect for housing dozens if not hundreds of people. The entrance leading to the shelter was still there. I opened the hatch and we made our way inside. We were safe. Finally safe. We sealed the hatch and each made our own way. It may sound strange, but I really needed a drink. I was never one for alcohol, but I figured that I had earned a shot or dozen. As for Robert, he turned out okay. It seems that the bullet simply grazed him. Nothing a few stitches couldn't, you know, fix. I was told all of this much later, you understand. I had passed out and woke up feeling like my skull was being split open. I had made my way out of the sleeping quarters and I heard voices. Everybody was in the cafeteria. Some were talking, laughing, and a few were crying. One of our team's family members, no idea whose, came up to me and thanked me for saving their lives. I was surprised. The last thing I expected was gratitude, if anything. I expected resentment towards taking them from their lives. I didn't know what to say, so I simply nodded. I looked around and noticed that Robert was nowhere to be seen. 
I began to worry. I asked where he was. One of the men, Jerry, I think his name was, said that he hadn't seen him in hours. I began to search for him, making my way through the facility. I felt like I had been walking for hours. Unlike Robert, I was not familiar with the layout of the shelter, so I was completely lost. Eventually, I headed back the way I came and went to lie down in the sleeping quarters. It was there that I found him. He was scribbling in some notebook and muttering to himself, almost as if nothing had changed. I could see his bandage underneath his shirt. I don't remember if I called out his name, gasped, or even did anything at all besides just stand there. But he suddenly turned around, and I could see how very tired he was. I asked if he was okay, but he just said that he had a plan to fix everything, and that he just needed a little more time. Time for what? I asked. He didn't say anything, instead choosing to go back to writing in his notebook. I didn't know what else to do, so I just left him there to do whatever it was that was so important. I didn't see much of Robert in the next few weeks, and when I did, he was always mulling over his notes and talking to himself. The only time I ever saw him like that before was when we were working on this shelter. This time, though, it was almost as if he was even more invested in his work. What he was working on, though, I didn't know. I gave him his space, partially because I knew he was busy and partially because he was starting to scare me. Things were starting to get bad around the complex. People were starting to crack. They were here because of Robert. And I. And it was us that they looked to for answers. So what are we going to do? Where's Robert? How long are we going to be down here? My son's got diabetes. Do we have enough insulin? On and on it went. I wanted to give them answers. I really did. But I had none. Robert planned everything. I just helped him whenever he asked. When they realized that I didn't know any more than they did, the room went silent. They stared at me. I stared at them. I didn't know what else to do, so I just left. Later, I heard several people arguing with each other. Some spent their whole day crying. I pretended that I couldn't hear. Then one day, he woke me up in the middle of the night, this look of pure excitement on his face. I've done it, Francine. Done what? I asked, perplexed. I found a way to save us. Save everybody. He exclaimed with such energy that I had to tell him to keep it down or he'd wait the others. I could see the deep, dark bags under his eyes. When was the last time you slept? I asked, feeling more than a little concerned. Two, three days, not sure really. But that doesn't matter. I've done it. I started to ask him just what in God's name he was talking about when he interrupted me. You'll see. He kissed me on the forehead and left me there, staring after him as he receded into the shadows. That was the last time I saw him alive. It was the scream that woke me. I jumped out of bed and ran from the room. Looking for the source of the scream, I was so afraid. Had it finally happened? Were they finally starting to kill each other? Then, down the hall, I saw them. Everyone was gathered in front of Robert's office. My stomach tightened. I felt sick. As I approached, the crowd silently cleared the way. I made my way through the crowd. Then I saw him. Robert was sitting in his chair behind his desk, this little frown on his face. In his dangled hand was a half-empty bottle of pills. He stood there staring, not feeling, 
It just didn't seem real. Robert would not do that. Robert couldn't do that. Not after everything that we went through. I hit him. I screamed at him. How could he? How dare he? He saved my life when I tried to do the same thing. And now after all that, after all we went through, he just left me here? Alone? Bastard. His body was cremated. I wasn't there to see it. I couldn't. I stayed in my quarters for the next few days. I spent most of my time sleeping. Dreaming of starless skies. It was a week later when it started happening. There were shots. This time it was a family. The father was one of the grad students that had been with me and Robert from the very beginning. Looking at the scene, it was obvious that he had killed his children first, then his wife, then himself. The most disturbing part was that there was no sign of a struggle. That hit me hard. They had just given up. Unable to face the next day, they just checked out. That night, another family was gone. The day after that, a man and his wife. A month later, there was less than half. A week after that, there was no one. No one but me. I took it upon myself to cremate them. I wasn't even shocked. When you see something enough times, it loses its ability to shock and frighten you. I took them one at a time to the furnace. And when there was nobody left, I went back to my quarters. How long I stayed there, I couldn't tell you. It's easy to lose track of time when you're underground. Eventually, I got up and left the room. What the point of it was, I didn't know, but I had to get out of there. I walked. I walked and walked until I found myself in another part of the complex I hadn't seen before. That's when I met you. I was so confused when I saw it. All of that equipment and I don't even know what. I always knew that Robert was a genius in his field, but not on that level. I look back and I still feel like it was some sort of a dream. But it wasn't, was it? You were real. You scared the hell out of me, you know. I mean, how often do you meet a real AI? But I'm really glad I met you. If I hadn't found you that day, I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have joined the others and, and just... You saved me. You really did. I never would have made it if it wasn't for you. Not just because of all the work you helped me with in keeping this place running, and not because of all the food you brought in from the outside, but because you didn't leave me alone. And I never wanted to leave you alone. I promised myself that I'd never do that to you. But I have to break my promise. I'm dying. I'm so sorry. I know I know it's not fair, and I know it's not right, but it is the truth. I'm going to leave this message in your data banks on your next maintenance check. It should play in exactly one year. By then I'll be gone. But if you ever feel alone, I want you to look up at the stars. Because somewhere out there, among those countless lights will be me smiling down at you. I've... I've got to go now. I'll miss you. I'll remember you. Will you remember me? I'm standing in front of a burnt tree on a hill overlooking the complex I once called home. I look down at the unmarked grave I dug one year ago. 
I look up at the starlit sky, and I remember. I will always remember. It's no secret that I drink. My friends will make jokes, like, "Your idea of a balanced diet is a beer in both hands." I'll laugh with them, but I don't miss their pitying smirks. When I'm out, I'm out to have a good time, though. And when I'm in, well, either way, it feels like I'm only smiling once I've knocked back a few. I have this weird habit when I'm drinking alone, where I like to watch myself get drunk in the mirror. I start off by seeing this drab, aging, overweight slob, and I'll make a game out of drinking. Until he looks happy, I'll grin, and make faces, and watch myself laugh, and wonder why I can't be like this all of the time. I can steal a few hours from reality, until my girlfriend gets home from work, and we start to bicker, and then, everything that didn't exist a moment before, is suddenly there, again. The second she walks in the door, and sees that I've been drinking, the smile disappears from the mirror. Usually, we'll only have a discussion, although she's the only one talking, so I tend to think of it as a lecture. Sometimes she'll give up and let it go. But then there's cases like the other night, where she works herself into some kind of frenzy. I guess I'd forgotten to pick her up. I knew it was my fault, and I apologized. But it didn't matter. Nothing I said got through to her anymore. It was like she couldn't even hear me, and she just kept getting louder and louder. Until all the words morphed into one long, angry blast, not ceasing until the door slammed behind her. It was just me in the mirror after that, so I took another drink and watched it smile—a big, sloppy smile, as wide as I'd seen, stretching my face into a caricature of itself. It would have been heartwarming to see if I really had been smiling. I turned my head slowly, from side to side, watching the mirror from my peripheral vision. The man in the mirror turned too, matching my movements exactly, giving me full view to all its leering teeth. Meanwhile. I felt my own closed mouth with my hands, just to be sure. The mirror was smiling, but I was not. That unnerved the hell out of me. It was a wake-up call. I emptied the rest of my bottle down the sink, and I went to lie down for a while. The weird thing was that I didn't really feel drunk, though. I was still walking straight. Thinking clearly, I was barely even buzzed. Laying there in the dark, and thinking about what happened, wasn't any better. I felt like I was going to start sobbing. After about an hour of tossing and turning and hating myself, I got up to use the bathroom, and looked in the mirror again. I wanted to see myself smile, even if it wasn't real, just to know that it was still possible. I was even more sober than last time. I could feel the miserable weight of it. My reflection, though, a coy dimple at first, but before my eyes, it was stretching into a beaming grin. I felt my slack. Loose face again, 
with both hands, then reaching out to touch the smile in the mirror. My hand tensed into a rigid claw. I didn't feel the glass. I felt the warm, moist, tightly pulled lip. The stubble of its face, the curve of its chin, my hand slipping through the mirror, as though it wasn't even there. I wasn't afraid exactly, more mesmerized by something so far beyond my understanding. Then, when my reflection turned to walk away, I felt like part of me was leaving with it. I watched myself exit the bathroom on the other side of the glass. Now the mirror showed an empty bathroom, and my reflection was gone. I touched the glass again, and it felt cold. The smooth surface I was familiar with. I was about to try and sleep whatever this was off, but then I heard the door open. She's back. She changed her mind. Suddenly, the mirror didn't matter. I raced through my apartment faster than any kid on Christmas morning, stumbling to a halt when I reached the living room. It was empty. The door was locked. No one had entered. But then I heard her voice. Look, I know I said I wasn't coming back, but... Her voice was coming from behind me, sounding muffled almost as though she was speaking underwater. I raced back to the bathroom, the mirror still empty of my reflection. I was beginning to think it was another hallucination, when I heard, I'm so sorry, I'm going to be a new man from now on. I promise. My own voice, coming from inside the mirror? It too was muffled, seemingly a long way off. But even if my reflection had left its bathroom and gone into its version of my living room, how could my girlfriend had entered that living room instead of my own? You look different somehow, she said. I can't quite put my finger on it. Unless, of course, I had changed places with my own reflection somehow. If he was in my real living room, and if I was behind the mirror. Did you do something with your hair? It's usually parted the other way, she added. I'm just happy to see you, that's all, my voice said. I guess you're not used to seeing me smile. Maybe you're right. It's a good change. I climbed onto the counter at this point, an inch from the glass. But still... No reflection. I mapped the entire surface with my hands, then harder, pounding my fists against the mirror, watching the whole pane rattle against the wall. Hello? Can anyone hear me? I shouted. If they could, they made no sign. I heard them talking softly for a while, and then she started to laugh. I don't remember the last time I heard her laugh. I was getting desperate by this point. I wanted to smash the mirror to pieces, but I was afraid. That would block my only route home. I sprinted back to the living room, threw open the door searching for something, anything, to make sense out of this madness. I didn't make it far. Before I heard her scream, though, and I felt compelled to run back and see what was going on. My heart leapt when I saw my reflection again in the bathroom mirror. He was still smiling, even humming to himself while he washed his hands in the sink, washing the blood from his hands. I couldn't hold myself back anymore. I threw my whole body against the mirror, and it exploded on impact, splintering shards of shrapnel, showering a thousand bloody hands, which rained around me, 
I didn't stop hurling myself again and again into the empty frame, smashing and driving each fragment of glass into my hands until there was nothing left but diamond dust. I was heaving for breath when I walked back into the living room. My real living room. I knew it was real because I saw her on the couch, her throat and mouth cleanly slit from end to end, smiling wider than she ever had when she was with me. I took my keys and my wallet and I ran leaving everything behind for good. The police caught up with me about a week later. They interviewed me and took prints, but apparently the one on the knife didn't match mine. They were completely backward in fact. I haven't had a drink since that day, but God knows I've wanted to. I guess I'm just too afraid to look in the mirror and see myself smile. Sarah and David had been very happy once. They were the type of couple that made other people envious and deprived. They had hit jackpot when they had met each other those many years ago. Knowing Sarah and David Bright, you would know that they were good people. They would do just about anything to help out a friend in need. Knowing this makes it so much harder to believe that they ever deserved what happened to them. So if the rule goes that no matter how kind and gentle and law-abiding you are, evil and despicable things can happen to you anyway, some, I guess, would say, how can God exist at all? The day that sealed their fate was a Tuesday, and the time was 10.08 a.m. That was when the last unopened box had been carried inside their new house, and the door had closed behind them. Sarah had a smile on her face that was beginning to hurt. David brought in a bottle of wine and poured it into two glasses. They stood in contented silence, sipping their wine and scanning their eyes over the walls and door frames and the polished wooden floors. This was their home. They'd finally done it. If you had known the happiness and satisfaction they had felt right at that moment, it would be hard to believe the misery and depression that would fall upon them like a thick, heavy tar that they wouldn't be able to get out of. It wasn't long before the arguments began, starting with petty disagreements, fraying patients to blinding, uncontrollable fights that led to damage in days of not talking. Sarah would find herself sobbing in the bath. Why, she was not sure. All she knew for definite was the continuing clawing feeling of despair in the pit of her stomach. Something bad was going to happen. David would spend most of his time in front of the television alone, after Sarah had silently sulked up to the bed without him. He didn't bother asking her what her problem was anymore, and he wasn't sure he gave a shit anyway. He just kept replaying his head how much better he was before they moved in together. Maybe now he was really seeing a different side to Sarah. After all, she never stopped whining and disagreeing with him, battling against him 24-7. What happened to the fun-loving, laid-back Sarah he remembered? It was these many times alone in front of the television that he would begin to hear someone preparing food in the kitchen. A familiar sound of running taps and clinking plates and cups. Time and time again, he would question whether Sarah had snuck back down the stairs when he hadn't looked. And time and time again, he would walk slowly into the kitchen and no one would be there. He had said once to Sarah how their walls must be thin because he could hear everything the neighbors were getting up to. Sarah let him speak, but she never replied. She seemed to be doing that a lot lately. There, but not really there at all. All this bad feeling and unusual events would lead up to a normal Saturday night where another big fight between Sarah and David was beginning. David was almost shocked to hear his wife's voice after so many weeks of limited conversation. She was screaming at him now. Her piercing voice was hurting his head. 
She was screaming so loud. He knew that much. But he couldn't make out a single word she was saying. He was looking into her eyes, and he saw the hatred. He saw the searing anger behind him. She was so terrifyingly angry. But why? David tried to remember, but he honestly couldn't. It wasn't like he hadn't been trying to listen, but it was like he had woken up halfway through. But now David was getting angry himself. He hadn't done anything. At least, he was sure he hadn't. What right did she have yelling at him like this? He had grown quite accustomed to her silence, and now her howling was really pissing him off. It seemed to have grown to an unreachable level when he eventually bellowed, Shut the fuck up! He hadn't even realized he had a wine glass in his hand, and when he slammed it down onto the table, it shattered. The pain of the broken glass slicing clean into his hand helped to rip him out of the red mist that had descended on him. Beautiful crimson blood began to drip and splatter onto the kitchen table. David took his gaze off his wounded hand and looked up to see Sarah was gone. He heard the faint sound of their bedroom door slamming shut. Jesus Christ was he stressed. He reached over for his cigarettes, smearing blood accidentally over the packet. He lifted the top to see there was no cigarette left. Frustrated, he threw the empty packet across the room and threw himself back down on the sofa. He didn't want to do this anymore. He was just so tired, so unbelievably tired. At that moment, David's eyes closed and he began a descent into a deep, dark slumber. Sarah opened her eyes and was faced with the illuminated green numbers on her digital clock. It was 3.15 a.m. She felt hungover, but she hadn't been drinking. She turned her body to see if David was lying beside her. He wasn't, but that wasn't unusual anymore. Then, in an instance, she remembered their fight. By remembered, she meant she knew there had been one, but what about she didn't recall. She pulled her legs over the edge of the side of the bed and felt her feet touch the cold wood floor. She felt a chill spread up her, but then a different kind of chill spread through her. She caught a dark face and hand slowly closing her bedroom door as if leaving. The fear inside her was immense. A fever seemed to spread through her and the fizzing inside her body was uncontrollable. Whoever it was had smiled at her. She didn't remember any of their features, but she knew unequivocally that it had smiled at her. It wasn't a friendly smile. It was a got you smile. It wasn't David. It couldn't have been David. She was certain she could hear his snoring downstairs where she had left him. She just sat there at the edge of the bed eyes wide like saucers, just watching as the door slowly clicked shut. It seemed to be a few minutes before she could move her body again. Had she really just been paralyzed with fear? Slowly she left the bedroom and walked down the stairs. The stress was overwhelming. As she got to the second to last step, she could see David asleep on the sofa but she also noticed the small pool of blood below his outstretched arm. Without thinking and almost forgetting about the mystery intruder, she rushed to him and inspected his hand. It was a deep cut, most probably needed stitches. She would have to take him to the hospital in the morning. She took some bandages out for the first aid kit and gently bounded his hand. As she watched her husband sleeping, Analyzing the lines of his face, she remembered how much she loved him. What had happened to them?
She must have sat back in the armchair after nursing to David and fallen asleep, because she, when she awoke, she was in the lounge. She looked at the sofa where David no longer was. David? She called out. At first it came out like a whisper, but built up volume toward the end. David appeared in the doorway of the kitchen with a piece of buttered toast in his hand. Sarah cleared her throat to speak. How's your hand? I think we might have to take you to have it stitched up. David looked at her confused and cocked his head. What? Sarah was now starting to feel uneasy. You cut your hand last night. I bandaged it. You were bleeding everywhere and it was quite deep. David pushed his hand into her face like an unruly child. Sarah stared hard at his hand. It was fine. No cut or wound of any kind. Her mind began reeling. She didn't feel so good. What are you going on about, Sarah? He said, irritated. Sarah sat there in disbelief. It wasn't a dream. She knew it wasn't a dream. David left the room and carried on making breakfast in the kitchen as if he didn't have a care in the world. As she sat there, retracing all memories of last night, trying to make sense of it all, her eyes suddenly rested on an empty cigarette pack down the side of the display cabinet. That uncontrollable fizzing feeling seized her body again. It was a cigarette packet covered in blood. She almost flung herself across the room to retrieve it. Yes, it was David's empty cigarette packet with dried dark brownish blood on it. When she shoved it in David's face a moment later, David's body language completely changed. She saw the man that she loved turn into a small, vulnerable child. She could tell looking into his pale, clammy face that he was remembering finally the events of last night. Like the banks of the river had burst and the water was flooding into his mind. He turned from her, and as he walked away, she heard him whisper under his breath, What is happening to us? She had never in her entire life felt so alone and out of control. A week after that event, Sarah and David seemed to be walking around like zombies. Getting up, going to work, and eating dinner separately. Sarah sleeping in their bed, David sleeping on the sofa. Close friends and family began to suspect that there were problems in the marriage, but didn't dare ask. One afternoon, Sarah caught David rubbing his neck and coughing, but his coughing was more like retching, and he was struggling to breathe. Sarah asked him how long he had it, and he said a couple of days. She took the cough syrup out of the cupboard and placed it on the table in front of him, and that was the only act of sympathy she gave. But soon his retching and coughing was keeping her up at night. She found herself staring at the ceiling, listening to that awful noise, praying that it would stop. The sound of it filling her with such dread, she began to sob. She sobbed until she fell asleep, hoping for a second that she never woke up. She was half asleep, but she came to the realization that someone was tucking the sheets around her body like she, a mother, tucking her child in. But instead of love and security, it felt like someone was trying to imprison her, trying to immobilize her. She opened her eyes, but her vision was blurry. The voice that filled the room that night made her wet the bed. It was a raspy, like scraping gravelly voice, and it sang her a lullaby. Hang, hang the man, so he swings gently in the breeze. Cut him down and slice his crown and feed him all to me. The terror that she felt was overwhelming. It felt like it had such a hold on her, she was going to implode. 
Sweat soaked her entire body as she rattled with an unimaginable cold. The lullaby was repeated multiple times and then came to an abrupt stop. She lifted her head, expecting to see the smiling figure from before above her bed. But there was no one. Nothing but the darkness enveloping the room. Her head wouldn't stop racing. She couldn't catch a breath. She needed to get out of this house. She needed to escape right away. She pulled her coat around her and slipped on whatever shoes she could find, and she ran down the stairs calling David's name. We have to leave. We have to leave. She seemed to be screaming hysterically. David was hearing Sarah wailing again, and it was pissing him off. He didn't bother to open his eyes. He just turned his body to a more comfortable position and muttered, You can leave, I'm staying here. Sarah left that day. She didn't think to stay with her husband, the man she had been with for nine years. The man she loved and would have protected. She was a wild animal trapped in a cage, biting and scratching and twisting just to get out. As she ran down the street, her mind was blank. She ran and ran with no destination in mind, just to run away from all the pain in her life. Eventually, when she came to her senses, she walked to her sister's house and asked to stay the night. Her sister, of course, understood. The sister she saw in front of her was weary, scared, and pale. Have you had a fight with David? Sarah just replied. Can I sleep? Can I just sleep, please? So Sarah's sister settled her in and looked over her little sister with concern. In the morning, Sarah's sister convinced her to have a hearty breakfast, cup of tea, and go home and make things up with David. She lectured her about how they were good together, and that the move and worrying about finances had probably stressed them out, and they were taking it out on each other. Sarah ate her breakfast, thanked her sister for her help, and walked home. She felt so much better, lighter, brighter, but as she approached the house, her stomach dropped. She didn't want to go inside. She never wanted to go inside again, but she was going to make things up with David. She was going to convince him to sell the house. As she pushed her key into the lock, that awful consuming sickness began to push stomach acid up to her throat. She wasn't sure she could do it. With the last shred of courage she had left, she turned the lock and walked inside. As soon as she was in the house, she heard running water. The noise was strangely soothing. She began to call out his name as she climbed the stairs. Every step she took, she strained her ears to hear any movements around her. As she reached the landing, she noticed water seeping out from underneath the bathroom door. David? No answer. She knew in an instant that when she opened that door, her life was going to change. Something so bad she couldn't stomach it was going to be behind that door. She had to see it. She had to finish whatever this was. So she placed her sweaty palm onto the door handle and opened the door. The scene she saw before her stole all the air from her lungs. Weird spots began to dance in front of her eyes. There was David. He was hanging in mid-air. He was staring right at her, eyes filled with terror and despair. He began to make that coughing, retching sound again, but it sounded muffled in Sarah's ears. All she could hear was her heart pounding in her head. They stared at each other for a minute, in complete and utter disbelief. Sarah staring up at him, and David staring down at her. Water was still pouring over the sides of the overflowing bath and filled up the floor around her trainers. 
She slowly looked down at her feet and watched it slither around her foot as if it was an island. And that is when she saw it. Two footprints in the water. Two footprints devoid of water. As if someone invisible was standing there, holding David up with their bare hands. And before Sarah could piece it all together, an all too familiar lullaby broke the suffocating silence. Hang, hang, hang the man, so he swings gently in the breeze. Cut him down and slides his prow and feed him all to me. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I would like to extend a huge thank you to the incredible Darkness Tales for helping me today with the amazing stories you heard. He's a lovely guy, and a phenomenally talented narrator. So please, go check out his awesome channel, and some of his amazing works for more astounding stories, just like the ones that you heard tonight. You will be able to find a link on screen now, and in the description, to this incredible narrator's channel. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.